Good evening aspirants. Welcome to the Hindu Daily News Analysis brought to you by Shankar IAS Academy for the date 23rd of November 2022. The articles taken up for today's discussion are displayed here. You can have a look. With this, let's start with our first article discussion for the day. Have a look at this news article. This is from yesterday's newspaper. The news is that the political party Congress will file a review petition in the Supreme Court. This is against the order that has led to the release of six convicts in the Rajiv Gandhi assassination case. This is the crux of the news article given here. In this context, let us learn about the review and the curative petitions. First of all, what is a review petition? See. A review petition is the Supreme Court's ability to re-examine its own judgments. Here note that a review petition is never a new hearing or an appeal. It is the device available to the top court of the land to fix a mistake done in a previous judgment. This review can be done as per Article 137 of the Indian Constitution subject to the rules made under Article 145. To put it more simply, Review petition is like an appeal against the decision of the Supreme Court itself. But as said earlier, technically it cannot be termed as an appeal. Here note that there is no legal provision which necessitates the approval of a review petition by the Supreme Court. Also know that a review petition is to be filed within 30 days of the pronouncement of the judgment or the order by the Supreme Court. This is as per the Supreme Court rules 1966. The review petition filed must be distributed to the same panel that gave the verdict or the judgment. Now coming to the question, what if a review petition is dismissed by the Supreme Court? In that case, it may consider a curative petition filed by the petitioner. This is to prevent the abuse of process if any had taken place before. So now coming to the question, what is a curative petition? See, a curative petition will be the last legal option open to an individual after the rejection of review petition. So, practically, it is like the last legal appeal device present right now in our country to the decision of the court. Here note that the curative petition is not directly mentioned in the Indian constitution. It is only indirectly specified by Article 137 which talks about the Supreme Court's power to review a order. So, when a curative petition is filed, the Supreme Court is extremely cautious. This is why the Supreme Court has established particular standards to be followed when considering curative petitions. That is, they should only be considered only in rarest of rare circumstances. For example, curative petition can be entertained when a fundamental tenet of natural justice has been violated. Here note that a curative petition is required to be certified by a senior advocate and then it is circulated to the three senior most judges and the judges who delivered the impugned judgment. Unlike review petition which need to be filed within 30 days of the judgment, curative petition has no time limit. This is all about the curative petition. Through this discussion, we learned about two important legal concepts which is nothing but the review petition and the curative petition. With these learned points, now let's move on to the next news article. Take a look at this text and context article. It talks about a landmark judgment given by the Supreme Court on November 16th. In its judgment, the Supreme Court has asked the Indian Air Force to consider the grant of pensionary benefits to 32 short service commission women officers. After 12 long years of struggle, these 32 short service commission women officers were granted this right. So, in this backdrop, let us understand what is meant by permanent commission and short service commission. See, a permanent commission means a career in the army till you retire. For one to get permanent commission in an army, he or she has to join the National Defense Academy or the Indian Military Academy. Now, coming to the short service commission. See, short service commission is another option of joining the army and serving as a commissioned officer for a period of 10 years. At the end of this period, a person will have two options. They can either elect for a permanent commission or opt out and lead a civilian life. Remember, the army allows the conversion of short service commission officers to permanent commission officers only based on their annual confidential reports and other achievements. 
see there is an indirect obligation on the officer to prove their worth during the first 10 years of his or her short service commission here note that if suppose the person is not selected for permanent commission they still have the option for a 4 year extension they can resign at any time during this period also now coming to the main issue discussed in the article the issue is that while male short service commission officers could opt for permanent commission at the end of 10 years of service this option was not available to women officers because of this particular reason women were kept out of any command appointment and could not qualify for government pension see government pension only starts after 20 years of service as an officer in army because of this reason the judgment in today's article becomes significant The Supreme Court exercised its extraordinary power under Article 142 of the Constitution for doing complete justice. This is all about the Short Service Commission and Permanent Commission. Now let's see about the status of Permanent Commission to the women armed force officers in the three different armed forces of our country. See, after the intervention of the Supreme Court, the Army, Navy and the Indian Air Force has opened Permanent Commission to women. here note that our supreme court of india has played a major part in helping women in the armed forces to become permanent commission officers it is because of supreme court's judgment only the armed forces in our country has opened permanent commission to men see in a landmark judgment in the babita punia case in february 2020 supreme court directed women officers in the army be granted permanent commission in the same case it is also said that command postings in all services other than combat should be open to women officers further on march 25th 2021 the supreme court in lieutenant colonel nitisha versus union of india held that the army's selective acr evaluation process discriminated against women officers seeking permanent commission these two decisions has led to nearly 600 plus women getting permanent commission status in the indian army in the year 2021 this is all about this particular discussion in this discussion we have seen about the nomenclature's short service commission and the permanent commission also we saw about the role of supreme court in helping women getting the permanent commission status in the indian armed forces with these learned points now let's move on to the next news article discussion look at this news article see yesterday indonesia's main island of java witnessed a shallow 5.6 magnitude earthquake the epicenter was near the town of sinjor where most of the victims were killed there were also reports of hundreds of people injured dozens feared trapped as buildings collapsed and landslides were triggered we have covered in detail about earthquake quite a lot of times in our hindu daily news analysis so in today's discussion let us understand why indonesia is prone to earthquakes but before that let us briefly understand where indonesia is located see indonesia is a country located off the coast of mainland southeast asia in the pacific and the indian oceans it is an archipelago that lies across the equator and spans a distance quite equivalent to 1/8 of the earth's circumference look at this map indonesia's islands are given here indonesian islands can be grouped into greater sunda islands of sumatra java the southern extent of borneo and celebes the lesser sunda islands of bali the capital of indonesia is located in jakarta which is located near the northwestern coast of java but recently its capital was relocated from jakarta to east kalimantan in the island of borneo the new capital city of the country will now be called as nusantara do you know the reason for the transfer of the capital the reason was climate change yes jakarta is now sinking at an alarming rate to avoid further calamities due to this a planned capital city nusantara is being built at the island of borneo make note of this point this can be asked in your prelims examination so now coming to the question why indonesia is vulnerable to earthquakes the first reason is because it is one of the equatorial countries which is located in the zone of pacific ring of fire for those who are not aware pacific ring of fire is a zone present in pacific ocean which is characterized by active volcanoes and earthquakes 
If you are wondering why there is a series of volcano eruptions and earthquakes in this region, it is because of the amount of movement of tectonic plates which is happening in this area. See, a tectonic plate is nothing but a massive, irregularly shaped slab of solid rock generally composed of both continental and oceanic lithosphere. Here note that whenever one tectonic plate moves under another or when one tectonic plate meets another tectonic plate, either earthquakes or volcano eruption will occur. In the Pacific Ring of Fire, more than 9 plates meet. These plates are Eurasian, North American, Cocos, Caribbean, Nazca, Antarctic, Indian, Australian, Philippine and other smaller plates. So, this is the first reason. Secondly, Indonesia is located at the meeting point of three major continental plates that is the Pacific Plate, the Eurasian Plate and the Indo-Australian Plates. And a much smaller Philippine Plate is also present in this region. As a result of all this, several volcanoes are located on the Indonesian islands which are prone to erupting. Currently, there are 147 volcanoes and 76 of them are spread along the islands of Sumatra, Java and Lesser Sunda. This means Indonesia has a tremendous opportunity to face eruption disaster in the near future as well. So, it can be rightly said that Indonesia is the window to the volcanic world. With this, we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion, we have seen about the location of Indonesian islands and the reason for the eruption of volcanoes and earthquakes frequently in this area. And we also saw about the transfer of the capital of Indonesia from Jakarta to Nusantara. With this information, now let's move on to the next article discussion. Take a look at this editorial. Title says, Strategy to Save. Now, don't think this editorial is going to talk about a strategy to save money. Not at all. This article talks about the National Suicide Prevention Strategy, which was recently released by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So, in this context, let us see some of the important points mentioned in the editorial article given here. See, as per WHO estimates, suicide is the second leading cause of death globally among 15 to 29 year olds. In India, more than 1 lakh lives are lost every year to suicide. In the past three years, the suicide rate has increased from 10.2 to 11.3 per 1 lakh population. As per the National Crime Records Bureau statistics, the most common reasons for suicide include family problems, illnesses, while other causes include marital conflicts, love affairs, bankruptcy, substance abuse and dependence. As you all know, the best first step towards addressing a malaise is to recognize that it exists. In that way, the publication National Suicide Prevention Strategy by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare is a right move in a right direction at the right time. Now, let's see some of the features of this strategy. Firstly, the strategy initiates steps to achieve a reduction in suicide mortality by 10% by 2030. And to achieve this, the ministry has created a time-bound action plan after considering the changing reality of varying ground situations. According to the document, these steps are crucial because the issue is serious. And the document also says that if targeted intervention programs and stigma reduction strategies are not implemented, a massive public health crisis might be upon us soon. Secondly, the document noted the majority of suicides are preventable. See, this particular statement is contrary to the wide-held public view that suicides are not preventable. So, to reduce the number of suicides, the strategy is built upon evidence-based practices. Secondly, it intends to bring together multiple sectoral collaborations to provide a cohesive strategy. Thirdly, the strategy has committed to establish effective surveillance mechanisms within the next three years. It has also committed for the establishment of psychiatric outpatient departments in all districts over five years. Apart from all these, the strategy also intends to incorporate mental health into educational institutions curricula within the next eight years. So, to conclude, addressing issues relevant only to India, such as pesticide access to farmers, and alcoholism among youth has put the strategy on the track to meet its objective. 
since it is such a good plan to be implemented the states must also participate with enthusiasm with this we have come to the end of this discussion through this discussion we saw some points relating to the national suicide prevention strategy with these points now let's move on to the next news article have a look at this news article the news is that iran has started enriching uranium to 60 percentage this is done in an underground facility called frodo that reopened 3 years ago the move was part of iran's response to the un nuclear watchdog's adoption of a censure motion which was against it this is what is given in the news article present here in this context before starting our discussion let us discuss about few points about the iran and the western world conflict if you have been reading newspaper consistently you can notice that the foreign page of the hindu gets flooded by the news articles related to the iran and the western bloc this is due to the constant tussle between the iran and the us to understand about this we have to go back in history the year was 1979 when the iranian revolution took place the islamic revolution which took place in iran led to the removal of the previous regime present in the nation and it has led to the clerics of the shia sect of islam to occupy the topmost positions present in the country this has led to the deteriorating relationship between iran and the western bloc finally after 35 years us president obama was able to strike a deal with the shia clerics present in the iran this deal was known as joint comprehensive plan of action and this deal was signed by p5 countries of un and germany with the iranian regime This agreement has led to the removal of sanctions which has been imposed by the western world on Iran and in turn Iran agreed to limit its nuclear capability but Trump withdrew from this agreement unilaterally which has led to again tussle between the two blocs this is why we have seen Iran developing nuclear weapons to frighten the western bloc this is the background of the issue behind the nuclear enrichment program of Iran with this information now let's see what is meant by nuclear enrichment c natural uranium deposits exist all over the world but uranium in its natural form is not suitable for the production of nuclear weapons also it cannot be used in most nuclear reactors for either producing electricity or for producing plutonium here know that natural uranium is composed of various isotopes of uranium now the question comes what is meant by isotopes atoms with the same number of protons but with a different number of neutrons are called as isotopes these isotopes share almost the same chemical properties but they differ in mass therefore they also differ in physical properties here note that natural uranium contains approximately 99.3 percentage of the uranium 238 isotope and it has only very small concentrations that is about 0.7 percentage of uranium 235 isotope see this uranium 235 isotope is a fissile isotope an isotope is considered fissile if it can be split by a slow moving neutron hence this uranium 235 fissile isotope of uranium is the most significant for nuclear fuel and nuclear weapons but to be useful for either of these purposes the concentration of uranium 235 must be increased This is done by separating it from uranium 238 through a process known as enrichment. Now we will see about this enrichment process. Uranium must be first mined from the uranium deposits in the earth crust. Then the mined uranium ore is crushed to separate the uranium from the surrounding rock. This process is known as milling. Milling produces uranium oxide concentrate commonly referred to as yellow cake. Then this yellow cake is transported to a conversion facility where impurities are removed and then the uranium is combined with fluorine to form uranium exofluoride which is a gas suitable for enrichment here know that since uranium 235 and uranium 238 are chemically identical chemical techniques normally used to purify other substances cannot be used to separate uranium so the most common and efficient uranium enrichment method uses gas centrifuges gas centrifuges uses centrifugal force to separate the two isotopes from the uranium exofluoride gas this is all about gas centrifuges 
ஹியர் நோ தட் யுரேனியம் என்ரிச்டு டு கான்சன்ட்ரேஷன்ஸ் அபோவ் ஜீரோ பாயிண்ட் செவன் பர்சன்டேஜ் பட் லெஸ் தேன் டுவெண்ட்டி பர்சன்டேஜ் யுரேனியம் டூ தேர்ட்டி ஃபைவ் இஸ் டிஃபைன்ட் ஆஸ் லோ என்ரிச்டு யுரேனியம் மோஸ்ட் நியூக்ளியர் ரியாக்டர்ஸ் ப்ரெசன்ட் அரவுண்ட் தி வேர்ல்ட் டுடே யூஸ் திஸ் லோ என்ரிச்டு யுரேனியம் தட் இஸ் அபவுட் த்ரீ டு ஃபைவ் பர்சன்டேஜ் யுரேனியம் டூ தேர்ட்டி ஃபைவ் த யுரேனியம் விச் இஸ் என்ரிச்டு டு மோர் தேன் டுவெண்ட்டி பர்சன்டேஜ் யுரேனியம் டூ தேர்ட்டி ஃபைவ் இஸ் டிஃபைன்ட் ஆஸ் ஹைலி என்ரிச்டு யுரேனியம் and this highly enriched uranium is what is used in nuclear weapons this is all about the process of nuclear enrichment through this discussion we have seen about the uranium mining uranium isotopes and also about the uranium enrichment process with this information now let's move on to the next news article see this poster here it is about the celebration of the 400th birth anniversary of lachit barfukan see he was the general of ahom dynasty who defeated the Mughal invaders in a major battle along the Brahmaputra river. In this context, let's learn about Hakom dynasty and also about Lachit Barfukan. Firstly, let's learn about Hakoms. See, the Hakoms were the descendants of Shan or Thai tribe who are of Chinese origin. The foundations of the Hakom kingdom were laid by Chowlang Sukapa and he is also considered to be the first Hakom king. During the 13th century, Sukapa along with his soldiers and allied political members entered the Brahmaputra valley of Assam. They entered the valley by crossing the Patkai Bom mountain range. Here a small assignment to you all. Take your atlas and see where is this Patkai Bom mountain range located. I mean the state in which it is located. After finding it, comment the state in the comment section. Now coming back. Sukapo created a new state by suppressing the older political system of the Buyans. See, Buyans were the local landlords who were present in Assam at that time. Then in the year 1253 he established his capital at Charaidu Assam and he also befriended the local tribals consisting of the Barahi and the Marans people. Remember, the home state was divided into clans or kelts. Almost all adult males of the homes served in the army during the war at other times they were engaged in the construction of public works and agriculture note that a homes introduced a new method of wet rice cultivation which increased the agricultural output of the region this is a brief about the ahom dynasty now let's move our attention towards lachit borfukan see lachit borfukan was a commander in the chief of the ahom army He served under the Hakom king Pratap Singha. Know that he was a contemporary of Shivaji Maharaj. During his time, he created a vital naval infrastructure along with his great strategies. That's why Lachit is the main inspiration behind the strengthening of India's naval force and in revitalizing India's inland water transport system. See, Lachit played a significant role in stemming out the advancement of Mughal imperialism in the Hakom dynasty. This is where the Battle of Sarai Ghat comes in. The Battle of Sarai Ghat was a naval battle fought in the year 1671. It was fought between the Mughal Empire on one hand and the Ahom Kingdom led by Lachit Barfukan on the other hand. It was fought on the banks of the Brahmaputra River at a place called Sarai Ghat which is now located in the Gauhati district of Assam. Here note that the Ahom army was numerically pretty weak when compared with the Mughal army. But under the bravery and extraordinary leadership exhibited by Lachit the Hakoms defeated the Mughal army they won the war by using brilliant tactics like use of terrain clever diplomatic negotiations guerrilla tactics psychological warfare and military intelligence see the battle of sarai ghat was observed as the last battle in the major last attempt by mughals to extend their empire into assam The Battle of Sarai Ghat is also one of the most underknown battles in India. Make a note of this battle and also about Lachit Barfukan. It is a potential prelims question. With this we have come to the end of this discussion. Through this discussion we briefly saw about Ahom Kingdom and also about Lachit Barfukan. With these points in mind now let's move on to the next news article. See this article here. This editorial article highlights the importance of participation of panchayat raj institutions in the climate action then the article also gives out some examples of carbon neutrality projects at the local levels across india finally the article speaks about the clean and green village theme of government of india 
So, in this discussion, we will understand the points given in the article. Before that, the syllabus relevant for this article is highlighted here for your reference. You can go through it. With this, let's start our discussion. Firstly, let's understand about the importance of participation of Panchayat Raj institutions in the climate action. See, India set some climate targets at the UNFCCC COP26 climate summit which was held in Glasgow last year. India announced its enhanced climate commitments which is popularly known as Panchamrit Resolution. One of the main commitments of India in this resolution is to achieve the target of net zero carbon emission by 2070. Here note that if India has to achieve the set of goals mentioned in the Panchamrit Resolution, it is necessary to involve the Panchayati Raj institutions. This is the theme based on which this editorial is written. On climate action, we have policies and large scale investments at international and national level. But when we look at the local level, there are no such policies. But the devastating effects of climate change advocates us to have a suitable local climate action plan. Apart from the plan, the government should also ensure greater finance devolution to the panjayats. This will help the panjayats to play a pivotal role in tackling many of the causes and effects of climate change. Now, coming to the important question, why the focus should be given to the local governments regarding climate change? See, over the past few decades, there has been manifold increase in the number of climate-related national disorders. As we all know, much of India's population still lives in the rural areas and most of them are involved in agriculture and other agri-related activities. The greater variability in rainfall and temperatures due to climate change has directly affected the livelihood and well-being of millions of rural households. So, this provides the primary reason why the focus should be given to the local governments. See, India has announced its National Action Plan on Climate Change in the year 2008. This plan identifies a range of priority areas for coordinated intervention at the national and state levels. But the action plan neglected the local government's participation. The author of this article feels that if the Panjayat Raj institutions had been given a greater role, we would have seen better results. See, in recent years, many Gram Panjayats on their own effort have come forward with carbon neutrality projects. Now, we will see some of those carbon neutrality projects brought out by the Panjayats present in India. Before that, let us briefly see how carbon neutrality helps in reducing emissions. The carbon neutrality advocates for zero carbon developments, nature conservation, sufficiency of food, energy and seeds and the economic development. As we all know, human activities are the main cause of the current climate crisis. Therefore, we as humans need to take measures that would help in mitigating greenhouse gas emissions. So, the zero carbon development, which is a part of carbon neutrality, promotes sustainable living. And it is the effective solution to reduce anthropogenic emissions and it helps in improving climate resilience. Coming back to the examples. A prominent example written in today's editorial is Meenangadi Gram Panjayat. It is located in the Kerala's Vayanar district. See, in the year 2016, this panjayat envisaged a project called Carbon Neutral Meenangadi. The main aim of the project is to transform Meenangadi into a state of carbon neutrality. Initially, they conducted campaigns, studies and awareness program about the carbon neutrality. Then, carbon gas emission inventory was also prepared. Subsequently, an action plan was finally prepared by organizing Gram Sabha meetings. Then, they also carried out socio-economic surveys and energy use mapping. Then, to further augment its carbon neutrality target, Meenangadi Panjayat introduced tree banking scheme. This scheme encouraged the planting of more trees by extending interest-free loans. Around 1,58,000 trees were planted and the trees have also been geotagged to monitor their growth. See, the entire village community was involved in this process. The scheme was started 5 years ago and now the changes are visible in the village. This is one of the apt examples provided by the author to prove that carbon neutrality projects can be taken at the local level. There is also another example. It is about the Palli Gram Panjayat which is located in the Union Territory of Jammu and Kashmir. See, Palli followed the people-centric model with specific local activities. 
the panchayat had prepared a climate resilient plan under the plan the villages have been made aware of climate change mitigation factors these factors include reducing energy consumption cutting down on the use of fossil fuels increasing the usage of solar energy and abandoning the use of plastics the palli gram panchayat also introduced biogas plants and the usage of solar panels a big solar plant was installed in the village to power nearly 340 households this is about the palli gram panchayat see there are also many other panchayats that have initiated carbon neutral programs we will see about them one by one firstly sichawal gram panchayat in punjab here with people's involvement the kali bain river was rejuvenated then comes the odan thurai panchayat in tamil nadu it has its own windmill with power generation capacity of nearly 350 kilowatts then comes the tk karwadi gram panchayat in maharashtra this panchayat is well known for its extensive use of biogas plants and green energy production and finally the author mentions about chapparapadavu gram panchayat in kerala see this panchayat has several green islands that have been nurtured by the community these are all some of the examples of carbon neutrality projects at the local level across india now let's briefly see about the clean and green village theme in an attempt on localizing the sustainable development goals the ministry of panchayati raj has introduced clean and green village theme under the theme the gram panchayats can take up activities on natural resource management biodiversity protection waste management and afforestation activities according to the latest data around 1 lakh gram panchayats have prioritized clean and green village as one of their focus areas for 2022-23 the net result is that many panchayats are coming forward with their own eco plans under the theme the ministry advocates for the documentation of best practices and the documented best practices will be widely circulated across india this is all about the clean and green village theme by the ministry of panchayati raj now what the overall discussion tells us the points and facts in the discussion highlights that india's rural local bodies are silently contributing their strength to ensuring the global target of carbon neutrality this is all about which is given in the editorial article through this discussion we have learned about the importance of panchayat raj institutions in helping india attain its carbon neutral goal by the year 2070 and we have also seen some of the examples of panchayats which are making a difference in the climate action plan of india with this information now let's move on to the next article discussion have a look at this news article it reports that tamil nadu government declared aritapatti and meenakshipuram villages in madurai district as the first biodiversity heritage site in the state and it is also said that this place will now be called as aritapatti biodiversity heritage site see this site is known for its ecological and historical significance there are around literally 250 species of birds inhabiting this area this includes three important raptors which are lager falcon the sahin falcon and the bonale seagull not only this it is also home to wildlife such as the indian pangolin slender loris and pythons this is the crux of the article given here in this context let's learn about the biodiversity heritage sites what are all the criteria for the identification declaration of the sites and finally about who has the power to declare biodiversity heritage sites with this let's start our discussion see biodiversity heritage sites are well defined areas that are unique and have a ecologically fragile ecosystem surrounding it see it may be terrestrial coastal or inland waters and marine we know that they have rich biodiversity thus it comprises of both rich wild and domesticated species biodiversity heritage site should also have high endemism here endemism means that a plant or animal living only in a particular location such as a specific island nation or other defined zones then the biodiversity heritage site will also have the presence of rare and threatened species keystone species species of evolutionary significance etc a site should also have significant cultural ethical or aesthetic value to be notified as an area of cultural diversity this is all about the basics of biodiversity heritage site the criteria for the identification of biodiversity heritage site is displayed here pause the video and have a look
Now, let us move on to see who can declare a biodiversity heritage site. See, the state biodiversity boards may invite suggestion for declaration of biodiversity heritage sites. It may also consider suggestions from the local communities living there. All this happens through a biodiversity management committee. It may also happen through other relevant community institutions including Gram Sabhas, Panjayats, Urban Wards, Forest Protection Committees, Tribal Councils, etc. Then, after serious scrutiny, the State Biodiversity Board issue a preliminary notification. This is to specify the boundaries of the Biodiversity Heritage Site. After 30 days of the draft notification of the Biodiversity Heritage Site, there will be a public hearing. After this, the announcement of the establishment of the Biodiversity Heritage Site is finally done. I have displayed here few of the Biodiversity Heritage Sites located in India. Pause the video and have a look. With this, let's move on to the second part of our discussion today, which is nothing but the prelims practice question discussion. Today, I have taken five different questions for our discussion. Now, let's start with the first question. Let me read out the question first. Consider the following statements. Statement 1. There is no time limit for filing review petition. From our discussion itself, we know that this statement is wrong because a review petition must be filed within 30 days of the final judgment. So, option 1 is incorrect. Now, coming to the second statement. Review petition is filed by an accused to the president asking for the change in capital punishment into life imprisonment. See, this statement is totally wrong. Review petition can be filed by anybody against the order of the Supreme Court. So, the statement is incorrect. The question is asking for the correct statement. So, the correct answer for this question is option D. Neither one nor two. Now, coming to the second question. See, this is a three statement question and the question is regarding Battle of Saraigat. Now, coming to the first statement. It was fought between Mughals and Aghoms on the Brahmaputra river. This statement is correct. Battle of Saraigat was a naval battle fought between the Mughal general Kachwaga king Raja Ram Singh I and the Aghom kingdom led by Lachit Barfukan. It was fought at a location called Saraigat, which is now in Gauhati district of Assam. So, the first statement is correct. Now, coming to the second statement. The home forces were led by Commander Lachit Barfukan. This is also correct. Statement 1 and 2 are correct. Now, coming to the third statement. The mighty Mughals won the battle and captured the home kingdom. See, this statement is absolutely wrong. We know from our discussion itself, Mughals were defeated and home retained its independence. So, eliminating option 3 from the options given below, we get only option A. So, the correct answer for this question is option A, 1 and 2 only. Now, moving to the third question. See, this is a previous year prelims question. Let me read out the question for you all. Which of the following is geographically closest to Great Nicobar? See, from the map here, we can see that Sumatra is closer to Great Nicobar than Java. So, the correct answer for this question is Sumatra. Now, moving to the fourth question. Recently, which organization has inducted its first women officers in combat role? Four different options are given. You have to choose the right option. See, questions like this have to be attended with utmost care. This question should be answered by you only if you know the right answer. If you don't know the answer, leave these type of questions because the chances of getting these types of questions wrong is high. The correct answer for this question is option B. Let me explain to you all why. Indo-Tibetan Border Police has inducted its first women officers in combat on 8th August 2021. It first commissioned two women officers in combat role after they completed their training at the ITBP Officers Training Academy located in Missouri. Here, combat is fighting between two groups of armed forces. When you engage in combat, typically this means you engage in fighting that involves weapons. So, traditionally, combat roles are assigned only to the men present in the armed forces and paramilitary. But ITBP has finally allowed women to take part in combat roles. So, this is a welcome step. So, the correct answer for this question is option B. Now, moving on to our final question. See, this is a two-statement question, but the question asked for the incorrect statement. Coming to the first statement. Accidental deaths and suicides in India is an annual report published by the Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. See, the statement is incorrect. Accidental deaths and suicides in India is an annual report published by National Crime Records Bureau, NCRB, and it is not published by Ministry of Health and Family Welfare. So, statement 1 is incorrect. Now, coming to the second statement. 
द लेटस्ट एडिशन ऑफ द रिपोर्ट पर्टेन्स टू दि इयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी सी द स्टेटमेंट इज आलसो इन करेक्ट द लेटस्ट एडिशन ऑफ एक्सीडेंटल डेथ्स एंड सूसइड्स इन इंडिया रिपोर्ट वाज पब्लिश्ड इन द इयर ट्वेंटी ट्वेंटी वन द क्वेश्चन आज फॉर दि इन करेक्ट स्टेटमेंट सो बोथ वन एंड टू आर इन करेक्ट सो द करेक्ट आंसर फॉर दिस क्वेश्चन इज ऑप्शन सी बोथ वन एंड टू द प्रिलिम्स प्राक्टिस क्वेश्चन फॉर यू इज डिस्प्लेड इयर इंटरेस्टेड एस्पिरेंट्स कैन पोस्ट दि रईट आंसर इन दि कमेंट सेक्शन The mains practice question is displayed here. Interested aspirants can write the answer and post it in the comment section. With this, we have come to the end of our discussion. If you have liked our video, please hit the like button, do comment and share it with your friends. Thank you for listening.